Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And, uh, and thanks for coming along tonight. Uh, this is I'm Not Racist, But. It's the second year we've done it, and it's part of the New South Wales Reconciliation, Pro New South Wales Reconciliation Council's program for uh, Reconciliation Week. My name's Lockie McCarr. I'm on the board at the Reconciliation Council. In, in a bit, I'll give you a bit of a rundown of what you're sort of, what you're going to be in for tonight, and, um, and, a, and a bit of an idea of, of how you can be involved also. First, I would like to start the official proceedings by welcoming Donna Ingram, who's going to give us a welcome to country. Bright lights. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be here this evening to offer you welcome to country for New South Wales Reconciliation Event for National Reconciliation Week. I'm not racist, but a forum to hear people from diverse backgrounds and the Race Discrimination Commissioner speak about racism in Australia. It gives me pride to represent my community in this important Aboriginal protocol as it recognises the unique position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australian culture and history. Thank you to the New South Wales Reconciliation Council for inviting me here this evening. I come with permission from my elders and to represent the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. The Metropolitan Land Council and its members are the recognised custodians in regards to Aboriginal issues, land and waters within its boundaries. The land we are meeting on this evening is the land of the Gadigal, one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation, which is bordered by the Hawkesbury, the Georges and the Nepean Rivers. I'm an Aboriginal woman who proudly identifies with the Wiradjuri Nation, which is Central West New South Wales, through my family connections. I was born on Gadigal land and I've been privileged to live, work and raised my four children on this land for most of my life. My mother was also born on this land. I acknowledge the Gadigal, whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with the land, Mother Earth, and thank them for their continued custodianship and for allowing us to meet here this evening. I'm also very proud to be part of the oldest living culture in the world, the Aboriginal culture of Australia, with our unique and distinct heritage, cultures and identities. I pay my respects to Aboriginal elders, both past and present, and realise the sacrifices made by our leaders to create a better future for Aboriginal people. I do this as a reminder and as a tribute to elders and those who have gone before us to fight for land rights, justice and equity for our people. These people achieve so much for our communities in the face of blatant and often violent racism. I extend my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and especially elders who are present this evening. I now offer you a warm and sincere welcome to the land of the Gadigal of the Eora Nation and wish you a safe stay on the land and safe travel from the land. On behalf of the Metropolitan Land Council, I hope you enjoy this, this evening's discussion and increase your understanding of the issues facing our communities and our ongoing fight for equality and recognition in our own country. We've come a long way, but there's much more work that needs to be done. Your, your attendance here this evening dis demonstrates the goodwill and support that exists to contribute to this work. I feel positive for all of our futures. In closing, it should be remembered that this is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you, have a great night. Thank you, Donna, for that welcome. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to acknowledge the, uh, the country that we're meeting on today and, uh, and pay my respects to, to the elders, both past and present. I'm lucky enough to say that I, I live and work in this area as well, and, and it's a beautiful area. It's also, uh, welcome to country isn't something we should take for granted, um, especially considering something I went through today, which is a story I'd just like to share with you. It happened a few hours ago. Um, and my daytime job, I was organising something that uh, we're doing this weekend in southwest Queensland. And... I was after a bit of information about who the traditional owners were, this area that we're going to be, um, we're going to be broadcasting from, basically. And so I called the council, because I figured the council you know, would be a pretty good place to start. And I spoke to almost everyone at the council um, and went around the whole shire and no one really had an idea of, of who would be the best Aboriginal group to acknowledge on the day, which is what we're after. Finally, probably about two hours ago, I got a call back from a, a lady and, um, and she was quite positive and I thought, oh, this is going well. And she said, um, uh, I had to explain obviously what I was after again for the 15th time. And then she said, um, 
oh, right, love, I know what you're after, I know what you're after. And I thought, finally, you know. And she said, um, so, so before you start the show, you want to you wanna do an acknowledgement of, of, of country music. <laughs> so still a bit of work to do. But, um, but as I said earlier, tonight we're here for, uh, for part of the Reconciliation Week program that the New South Wales Reconciliation Council is, is putting on. A bit of info about us, we're, we're the peak body, there's a pop there, isn't there, for, uh, for reconciliation in the state. And we're made up of both Indigenous and, and non-Indigenous uh, members, or both on the board and, and on the staff. Um, there is only three staff, though. I think that's really important to consider when, when you look at something like tonight and you consider how much work has gone into it and all the work that's gone into the Reconciliation Week program it, and obviously all the stuff that they do throughout the year. Obviously, we hold nights like tonight to promote reconciliation in Australia and also address some unfinished business and, and no doubt some of that some of that business is, is going to come up tonight because we're talking about something that's that's pretty ugly, really. And unfortunately, I'm sure everyone here has has experienced it in, in some way or another, either, either firsthand or otherwise. And I think at its most ridiculous, it's it's something that follows a phrase that shares the same name as tonight, you know, the, the, the equivalent of of someone saying to you, no offence, um, before offending you in the most profound way. Um, so tonight you'll hear from five speakers on that topic and, and would obviously love to hear from you as well. There's a, a bit of info up there about how you can get involved. That's normally, you know, the most fun part about it. Um, if you're on Twitter, not racist 2012 is, is the hashtag. Uh, if you're not on Twitter, Come on, you know, it's 2012. <laughs> you should probably leave. Um, if you're not on Twitter, you can actually, you can, you can text in, that's, that's fine. The number to do that is 0466550196, I think. That is up there, great. Um, and obviously we get to a lot of those questions at, at the end of uh, the speeches tonight as part of the Q&A. The first of those speakers I'd like, I'd, I would love, actually, I would love to introduce uh, to you right now. He's also going to be your MC for this evening. And, and this is a bit of a trip for me because when I first met this guy, he was, he was introducing me onto a stage uh, not too dissimilar to this um, at my school graduation. Um, and just to give you a bit of an idea of where I was at at the time, I had long dreadlocks um, and had a vest on that particular evening that I'd made out of a school woolly jumper um, <laughs> for some sort of act of rebellion that I've since, since forgotten. Um, had a few beers in the basketball courts and didn't really like school, so I was sort of ready to, 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 um, to get out of there, ready to get my certificate and leave. But then I heard, I heard this, um, this next gentleman speak on that particular night. And, I, and I, I sincerely hope some of you have this feeling tonight because for me, it, you know, it totally spun me out. Um, in the context, it was, it was this guy that achieved so much. I was so fond of the work he was doing in radio at the time. And here he was speaking at my school, and, and he'd gone to the same school that I had, and I, I, had, I had no idea, you know, until, until I heard him speak. Um, and yeah, as I said, you know, I hope some of you have that experience tonight, because for me, it, w it was the feeling of all these things I put in the too hard basket suddenly being possible and, and being really incredibly realistic. Um, anyway, on that night, he was really good to me, and, and he gave me his card. I probably said something really embarrassing to him. And, um, and he came into your he, – he said, here's the card. When you finish school, you know, come into work. I went into his work. I volunteered there for a few months, uh, way longer than they probably wanted me. And, um, and I've been in radio ever since, and so that was sort of – that was eight years ago. And matter of fact, now, now I work at Triple J, and I've been there the last few years, which is where we um, – where I first started volunteering for him. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce you, MC, for this evening, and the first of our speakers, Steve Kinane. Uh, thank you very much, Lockie, for those kind words. Um, I don't know what it was I said that night at that school graduation, but I know they never asked me back. Uh, <laughs> that was the last time I ever spoke at my school, and that was how long ago, Lockie? Uh, eight years. Eight years ago, there you go. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot for everyone for coming along tonight. It's a real privilege to be participating in such an important discussion and, and conversation. It's great to see a full house here too. Um, I'd like to, you all to join me in welcoming our speakers, Jennifer Wong, Benson Sorlo, Helen Zoki, and Nazim Hussain. Uh, 
And um, just up on the screen, we'll have a live Twitter feed with the hashtag NotRacist2012. Now, that's been just modified recently, so it's NotRacist2012. Be sure to ask any questions on that tweet stream, uh, to tweet any comments as well, and uh, I'll be taking some questions from your uh, Twitter questions a little bit later. I'm sorry there'll be no questions from the floor. I'll just take them from the Twitter feed. Now, our first speaker tonight is Jennifer Wong. Jennifer is a writer and a stand-up comedian. Off stage, she's written for Good News Week. She's also worked on Rove Daily and Can of Worms. In 2011, she was uh, one of five Australian comedians selected to perform at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival's new talent showcase, Comedy Zone, and also included in the Sydney Morning Herald's list of top 10 new comics to watch in 2011. And Jennifer will be performing here at the Seymour Centre in September, so make sure you come back then. Please welcome Jennifer Wong. Good evening, everyone. It's an honour to be here, and it was lovely. Um, such a privilege to be able to hear that beautiful welcome to country from Donna. So thank you very much um, for sharing this space tonight. It's very nice. Um, my name is Jennifer Wong, and I'm a comedian. Um, I'm not sure what you're expecting this evening um, to come to an event like this. I'm always curious about who is actually at an event like this. You know, is it a room full of recently reformed racists <laughs> hoping to top up? There is a pop, Lockie, you're right. I'm hoping to top up um, on what they've recently learned, you know, perhaps some hardcore racists, hoping to meet the one, because opposites <laughs> do attract. Right. But um, it's an honour to stand on stage and say something that I would possibly never actually say again in a stand-up environment, which is, I'm not racist, but some other chinks are. <laughs> Now, let me clarify that I strongly am telling the honest truth when I say that I would never say that in an environment where there was any doubt as to who I'm providing that laugh for. Humour is based on a shared knowledge and understanding of what the common ground is. So when I stand here at the Seymour Centre, I'm assuming that basically most of you aren't racist. If you are, please raise your hand and we will deal with you accordingly. <laughs> because that's my main beef, really. When we talk about tolerance, it's always about people tolerating other people's cultures. You know, as programming tonight, I understand that for diversity, I am here representing Asian female racist comedians. I get that, <laughs> right? So can I just say honestly that I'm sick of tolerance? I just, I've had enough. Why can't we say that racism isn't tolerable? My local post office has a sign and they do it very well. It's for staff only. I know I'm not actually supposed to see this message, but there's a poster that every time they open the door to get a package or to go in to get a cup of tea, it reveals what Australia Post is trying to do for their <coughs> staffing issues with racism. Now, it's a little bit complicated, and I'm just going to explain it to you briefly. This poster in the foreground is an Asian woman. I'm not sure from which part of Asia, but she's definitely Asian. <laughs> she's eating a bowl of noodles <laughs> with chopsticks. That's fine. Is everyone okay with that so far? <laughs> <laughs> Behind her is a man, a Caucasian. I'm not sure from which part of Caucasia. <laughs> <laughs> but he's definitely Caucasian. And he's standing behind her, not close enough so that he can touch her, but close enough that she can probably sense that there's someone behind her. And on this day, he's brought his hands towards his face and get your cameras ready, he's doing this. Behind him is a woman, she's blonde. I'm not sure if she's naturally blonde, but she's definitely laughing. And this interesting tableau has the headline, racism is unacceptable. I'd hate to see their sexual harassment campaign. <laughs> right. Now, the point here is, is that everyone at my local post office is from Southeast Asia, except for this one man, and he's Caucasian. I'm not sure from which part of Caucasia, but he's definitely Caucasian, and I'm not sure if this is a message just for him. 
I'm not sure if there had been an issue. You know, if this is a poster that's just like, Dave, why do you have to be so mean to Carol when she's eating lunch? I don't know if this problem is so widespread that, that Daves of the world are so stealthy that all my life I've been walking around not knowing <laughs> that at any moment there is, is there, is there a man behind me doing something that I'm not aware of? Right. Now, I'm not sure if I agree with the photo. I certainly agree with the message, right? I'm not sure what happened at Australia Post to result in this campaign, <laughs> right? I also do feel, though, that this campaign is a little bit racist, right? Uh, I'm not sure how you'd feel if you were Asian and you showed up to work every day and the first thing you saw was... <laughs> you know, I actually saw a woman from Australia Post eating lunch at a food court recently and the first thing I did was look behind her to see <laughs> if Steve was there, but I think Steve... Not Steve, Dave, sorry. Now I'm just kind of conflating. I think Dave eats at another part of the food court. Steve is not involved in this poster at all, right? But if you think about th what this poster is trying to do, it's dealing with stereotypes, right, which... Um, humour relies on. I could only have said today at the start that um, I'm not racist but other chinks are because, you know, there's a friendliness in this room. It's a safe space. We all acknowledge that racism is not something that we tolerate, right? I wouldn't, for example, go into a pub in small cities around Australia and say that because then the laugh is on me. The laugh is basically then saying to people, hey, you know what, I'm okay with being called a chink. You can call me a chink. Do you know how long it would take for me to ask a billion people if it's all right whether or not I can use the word chink to them? I suspect that they wouldn't like it anyway, right? That empowerment of that word is basically saying, if I, if I say it, it's endorsing the fact that I'm okay with that. From that, that jump, let me take you guys on a little jump to what I feel about what the problem is when the media also operates on that same basis of understanding, right? The headlines we see, they have to be quick, they have to be fast. It's very similar to writing a joke. What's the common understanding that we have that makes it all right for things to be said like all Muslims are racist, all Aboriginal people are lazy, right? From the short amount of time that I've worked in television, I can say that the proudest thing that I've ever done, which I've never spoken about before, is getting a picture on a Channel 10 program that had a girl in a headdress smiling. <coughs> All right. The only thing that I saw when I was growing up that was similar to my lifestyle was a lamb ad, <laughs> where a little Chinese girl was in a backyard eating lamb with a family that she'd probably met at school. And the parents, um, Caucasian parents, said to her kindly, this food is probably like from where you're from. Where are you from? And she said, Ballarat, actually. <laughs> so to see someone like that on television speaking English was a huge deal, right? Just that I suspect now for certain people growing up in Australia, it probably sucks to be a certain race because every time you open the newspaper or turn the TV on, you see people who represent your religion in a particular way. Um, I'm not saying that I'm making great leaps in any way, right? I think that walking down the street and being able to walk by without having someone say to you something racist um, is something that um, a lot of people take for granted. Here's a joke for you. Why are Asian people um, good friends with Muslim people? Gratitude, right? Because the target's moved, the target's shifted, right? But even more concerning than that is how rarely it seems as a normal person picking up a newspaper and seeing what the big headlines are, right? If it takes one week throughout the whole year for reconciliation to be in the headlines, for recognition to be the goal, um, I think we have a long way to go, right? You guys can all laugh when I get up and say things about Chinese people or Asian people because it's safe. I've made it friendly and okay to laugh about things like that. Um, but it's really hard to actually, for now anyway, to make a joke as a non-Aboriginal person about Aboriginal people. And why is that? The people I've spoken to have said, it's not for everyone to do yet. It's not your words, you know. Come and talk to us if you want to have something about Aboriginal um, identity or culture in your show. You know, don't just make the calls on our behalf. And I think that's true. I'll leave you with one joke, and this illustrates what I'm saying about whether or not things are equally available for everyone to talk about. I have a joke that I've been doing for three years. Um, oh no, I've ruined the, the <laughs> I've ruined the magic of comedy. Um, this is the joke. 
this is the joke, and I think uh, it's a good note for me to end on because it illustrates um, my lack of understanding and the lack of understanding of a lot of people. I think this is why I get to laugh. So my joke is that I'm calling the consulate, the Chinese consulate, because I need to get a visa, right? It's a really bad phone line, and I can't tell if uh, they're having trouble hearing me because other people are listening in, right? They wouldn't tell me what I asked, right? But it's a really bad phone line, and I'm, I need to give a lot of details, and they're not being understood. So I decide to be the most Australian version of myself ever. I'm going to be a clear communicator. I'm spelling out my name and he can't hear it. J-E-N-N. -N. He's like, M, M. I'm like, no, N, N. N for Nelly. He's like, oh, what is a Nelly? I'm like, I don't know. I think it's a fruit. After a while, he can't really... I, there's, there's a huge problem with communication and I'm throwing things at him out of frustration. I'm like, it's T. T for Tibet. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't recognise what you're saying. <laughs> it's T, T for Taiwan. <laughs> oh, did you say C, C for China? I'm like, no, 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 T. T for Tiananmen. <laughs> oh, P, P for peaceful demonstration. So he gets all my details and I'm about to hang up and the strangest thing happens. He says, it's my first week in your country. And I was wondering, why is it that Australia has such a wealthy population, but such a terrible record when it comes to human rights and the Aboriginal population? And I'm like, dude, mine was funny, and yours is just real. And I hung up. <laughs> that was my joke. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, our next speaker is Benson Sorlo. Uh, Benson was the 2011 Australian Youth Representative to the United Nations. He's the first Indigenous Australian to be appointed to that role. He also has a background in business and banking. He's been a business analyst for ANZ. And he's the Youth Representative on the National Commission for UNESCO, as well as being the National Director for the National Indigenous Youth Leadership Academy. Please welcome Benson. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, don't I appreciate, um, uh, yeah, really appreciate your wonderful welcome. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge, acknowledge that we are on Gadigal land, uh, the Eora Nation. Um, also, pay my respects, humbly pay my respects to elders past and present, and also acknowledge uh, other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that are with us today, and also our friends, our colleagues, and also our allies as well. I'd like to actually start off with um, with a poem. Um, I first heard this poem a couple of years ago, and it's by a, a Chicago fellow. He's, uh, he was born in 1926. His name's Oscar Brown Jr., and he was a, a civil rights activist, as, uh, as a lot of um, these strong black men were um, back in, uh, um, growing up in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. Uh, he's a, uh, a singer, a songwriter. He was a poet, and, uh, and this poem is called uh, The Children of Children. It goes, The Children of Children, by the time they're half grown have habits like rabbits and young of their own. The children of children from their mama's lap, hunted down to be ground, to be taken in traps. The children of children who are trapped in dark skins to stay in and play in a game no one wins. The children of children, while still young and sweet, are all damned and programmed for future defeat. The children of children who are trapped by adults who fail them, then jail them, to hide their results. The children of children unable to cope with systems that twist them and rob them of hope. The children of children of sin and the shame, despair and glare, but who is to blame? The children of children cry out every day. They beg you for rescuing, Ender. And what do you say? And what do you say? That is, it's a, it's a wonderful question when, uh, when posed with such such imagery. What do you say to the 2008 statistics which stated that 34% of Indigenous uh, young Australians 15 years or older reported that, in gr that reported grade nine as their highest attained level of education? What do you say to the Reconciliation Australia barometer which stated that only 
of sampled non-Indigenous Australians agreed that past policies still affect Australians, Indigenous Australians today. That means 36% on the other side of the, of the sampled non-Indigenous non Australians actually believed um, that the past injustices have actually affected Indigenous Australians still today. While I was travelling around, I, um, I've been quite lucky over the last couple of, um, last couple of years, actually. Um, first of all, that position as the, the Australian Youth Representative to the United Nations. I completed a road trip from Alice Springs up to Darwin and was uh, lucky enough to be able to stop off at a number of towns. And uh, one of the towns that I stopped at uh, was, was a little town called Elliot. And uh, I, was, I was walking around um, with the principal. And he said that no one had actually graduated year 12 uh, from this school in seven years. And unfortunately, that's a very common story when you go up through uh, the Northern Territory, across through the Kimberleys and Pilbara, and from Mount Isa right across North, uh, North Queensland. And, uh, and we kept walking around, and there was this sense of hopelessness that, that, that really kind of gripped this town, and it was really thick. It kind of hung in the air. And, uh, and the principal continued to walk us around, and he said, he pointed out one young boy and two young girls, and I think they were about year seven or year eight, and he said, these three young people, they have potential to be the first in their families, the first in their communities, to, to graduate year 12 and break that cycle of disadvantage which has gripped their town, that cycle of low expectation which has gripped their town. And right then, I felt a sense of hope that was coming out, that there was support out there, that there was people out there that were willing to put their hand up and say, no, no, this isn't good enough in Australia. Uh, we, have our, um, we have our problems, but this, right now, this is not good enough. I continued the road trip up to, up to Catherine. I was uh, speaking at a school up there, and we are running a bit of a workshop around the impact that young people can actually have on, on the future of Australia. And following the workshop, I, uh, I was pulled aside by this uh, young girl, I think she was about 16, and she said to me, she said, the stolen generation... The stolen generation should have worked. It's just that we didn't push it hard enough. And, uh, and it was just, you know, when, when things like that kind of happen, you just you don't know how to react. You just, you, it hits you. But you just, you know something's happening, but you just, you can't put your finger on it. It's just so in your face, so adverse, uh, overt, that you just, it can't be real. It can't, can't be happening. And, uh, but it was. And this was this young girl's uh, belief, that the stolen generation, and it's, that's even a funny term, saying stolen generation. These were, these were children. These were someone's children. It was stolen kids. And these are still people that are trying to get home, trying to find their families, trying to reconnect with culture, trying to reconnect with country. This was a generation of young people. There's a generation of children that were taken away from their parents. And she had that firm belief that it, it should have worked, really should have worked. But, you know, it just wasn't supported. It wasn't, wasn't pushed hard enough. And so I took her aside and I had a, had a I wouldn't say a stern talking to, but uh, I definitely had um, uh, a couple of words just to, to say, okay, well, how do, you, how do you come about to have this, uh, this kind of belief, this kind of understanding? And uh, it turns out it was from her parents. And... Uh, and her parents would have been about, I guess, 45, judging if she's, a, if she's about 16 or so. And, uh, and I said, what, what, about, what do you learn at school? And she said, all right, well, we learn about Indigenous issues. We learn a lot about them. We learn about the dream time. Learn about that in primary school. Learn about the, a bit on the stolen generation. We know about the schools, the boarding schools. A bit about the 1967 referendum. Yeah, something about... The Flora and Fauna Act didn't really stick, stick in my mind, didn't just stick in her mind. Um, about the 2000 Olympics with uh, Kathy Freeman, we all saw that. We thought that was a, a great symbol, a symbol of reconciliation. We know about the, uh, the 2008 apology uh, to the stolen generation. And I said, do you know about the 1965 freedom rides that went through country New South Wales? Do you know... Stories of our, our great champions that, that really pushed the civil rights movement. Our, our, our William Coopers, our William Barracks from down in our, um, from Corrindoke down in Victoria. And uh, of course she didn't. And, uh, and then it kind of dawned on me that it's our education that these young people are learning at, 
that aren't changing the perceptions around racism or, or what is acceptable in Australia. And it's this understanding that we're not challenging what young people should be learning or what young people should be proud about or what young people should feel a connection to because it's very, very important that we understand that this is a shared history, this is a shared past. But more importantly to that as well, that it's a shared future that we have going forward. And that's why schools really should, should be the places where these young people come to learn, but, but more than learn. Understand, be connected, feel a sense of identity. A sense of identity in the Australian culture, a sense of identity in the Indigenous culture as well. Because ultimately it's, it's our culture to share. It's all of our cultures. In 1966, Robert Kennedy, who was addressing the youth of South Africa, was actually on the, the Day of Affirmation, and he said that we can perhaps remember that those who live with us are our brothers and that we share the same short moment in life and they seek nothing but the chance to live out our lives and in purpose and in happiness. And it's this purpose and happiness that kind of brings us here today is that understanding that we need to understand that we want to challenge ourselves. We want to put ourselves in these situations where we can be challenged, we can have our thoughts pulled apart and our and analysed and we can think about life and think about our connection to each other. It's this fundamental belief that I am my brother's keeper, that I am my sister's keeper. It's a belief that isn't the foundation though. It's not the foundation of our society. And I feel that's a, it's a very sad thing. It's a very sad thing to understand that rolling back 70, the Racial Discrimination Act in 74 of communities up through the Northern Territory doesn't just affect those communities. It affects all of our communities. That one person's human rights being taken away in a detention centre doesn't just affect that person's human rights. It affects all of our human rights. It's that missing element, that, that, that idea that we are our brother's keeper is a missing element in what should be and what can be a reconciled nation. In 2010, Mick Gooder, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, gave a speech to the National Press Club in Canberra. And it was entitled, Towards a Reconciled Australia, Towards a Reconciled Nation. And within that, there was themes around sharing, mutual respect, identity, pride. And it's elements that I'm not getting. I'm not getting when I'm travelling around. I don't sense, I don't sense, or I don't see that sense of pride that we do have such a rich culture here. A rich culture coming out of the ground, a rich culture around us, a rich culture connecting us to the heavens. But we don't see that. I don't feel that. I don't feel that people are proud of that. But is this element that we need to understand, that connection that we have to each other, that responsibility that we have to each other, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our family? It's this element that enables us to declare that I'm not racist, but I have much to learn. I'm not racist, but I don't know about our shared history, but I, wanna, I want to know more about our shared futures. I'm not racist, but I feel a sense of disconnection. I feel a sense of disconnection with my fellow man. I feel a sense of disconne disconnection with the country, with the land around me but I'm willing to learn. And that's what we're all here to do. And that's what our journey is about. And it's towards that reconciliation, but it's also towards that recognition of the, the past injustices, but also the recognition of a shared future going forward. That we do all have, we do all leave a mark on each other. There's also a great quote um, by Pericles. He was, a, he was a general during the Peloponnesian War, so he was around 400 to 500 BC. And he said, what we leave behind is not what's carved into stone monuments, but what's woven in the hearts of others. And it's such a powerful quote and such a powerful line because it really is those small interactions that we have with each other, those small marks that we leave on each other, that we can say, oh, we, we were here. We did share the same time. We did share the same sense of purpose and sense of happiness. And ultimately, that's... That's what we want. That's what we want to share. So thank you very much for, for having us here, and thank you very much for your own journeys as well to, to come here and, uh, 
and take the time out. And I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces and a lot of friends. And, uh, and right here, this is, this is the community that we should be uh, all proud of and supportive of. So thank you. Thanks very much, Benson. And I'll remind everyone, if you want a question for any of the panellists, um, send a tweet, hashtag NotRacist2012. That's hashtag NotRacist2012. Our next guest is Dr Helen Zoki. Um, Helen is a Race Discrimination Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Before that, Helen was the Commissioner with the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. She's been involved in education and the community sector for a number of years, as well as being the patron of A New Beginnings and the Australia Arabic Women's Foundation Incorporated. Please welcome Helen. Um, thanks very much. Can I also begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners and uh, thanking you for the welcome. Um, it's, this is, I kind of feel like, you know, in the back of the papers where they have those puzzles and it's, you know, pick the odd one out and it's young, 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 not young. And so... <laughs> But I'm really pleased to be here and thank you to uh, Jenny and Benson for setting the scene in such um, powerful ways and, um, and I hope I can add to that. And I think my aspiration is to make sure that I'm not fodder for Nazim's summing up one way or the other. So um, what I want to do, I, I just want to um, perhaps pick up a little bit on uh, some of the more... Um, individual or personal stories that we've heard from Jenny and Benson. Um, and I've, I must start by saying that I feel incredibly privileged to take on the position of Race Discrimination Commissioner um, and to come from Victoria and, I guess, to see the rest of Australia. And some of that's really been heartwarming and a, a lot of it has been very confronting. And just to give you some context of my, um, my own journey, I, um, I was actually born in Broken Hill but brought up in Adelaide and then went to Tassie and my dad was a refugee after the Second World War. He's um, Hungarian and he's turning 90 this year. He's still kicking around. And, uh, and he, I guess, is an example of uh, someone who was a refugee who didn't ever quite make it in terms of settling in Australia. I don't mean in an economic sense but just in an emotional sense. And... Uh, some people may have heard me tell the story of my recent discussion with him uh, where he said, you know, when I die, I don't want to be buried in this soil because it's not my country, having lived here since 1950. So I think from that perspective, I have my own kind of acute sense about some of the things that are important around recognising different people and how they fit into this country. Um, but... One of the things that I've done in the last um, six months or so, one of the jobs I've been given to do is actually to develop a national anti-racism strategy and we're hoping to launch that campaign at the end of July. And Jenny, you've made me really nervous because inevitably a campaign has a slogan and has images. <laughs> and I'm, I'm ringing up our consultants and saying, don't go that way. Anyway... <laughs> So you're going to have to give us a bit of a critique. Maybe we need to get you in to kind of just road test it. But uh, I think some of your observations about the Australia Post campaign are really useful. I don't want to talk about all of that process, but I, wanted to, I just want to give you the voices of some of the people who responded to some of the consultations that we undertook around the anti-racism campaign. And I want to kind of bookmark them with some quotes from some other people around the concept of reconciliation. And these are all overseas people, and that's deliberately because uh, a number of things. Reconciliation is something which isn't unique to Australia, which, which Australia doesn't do well. Um, history is something which isn't unique to Australia, but which Australia doesn't do well. And I think Benson's points are really pertinent in, in that regard. Uh, and so part of what we have to do as a country is not only look in but out, and I think we... Whilst there are many things that are terrific about Australia, we, we aren't very good at picking up on some of the lessons and the most acute of those are in relation to what has happened to our First Nations people. So the first person I want to quote is actually a Canadian author called Alice, Alice, Alice Munro. And she's written a number of books and had a, and, and had a, um, a number of awards. And she talks 
probably about individual reconciliations and says moments of kindness and reconciliation are worth having, even if the parting has to come sooner or later. And I think that's important because reconciliation is about acknowledgement and it's about recognising grief and sorrow uh, and then perhaps moving on from that. And it's a sentiment which I think is sometimes disputed. And, uh, but it's a, it's a sentiment that I think in some sense is captured certainly within the human rights framework. And I would just talk to you about the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And I'll just read from that. The Declaration, amongst many things, is concerned that Indigenous people have suffered from historic injustices as a result of inter alia, their colonisation and dispossession of their lands, territories and resources, thus preventing them from exercising in particular their right to development in accordance with their own needs and interests. And that's a really important part of what we need to acknowledge when we talk about reconciliation. Let me just give you some of the quotes of the people who responded to our online survey about racism when we said, what does racism feel like for you? One person said, it makes me hate myself. Another person says it creates a divide. These are all direct quotes. Australia is one country, but it doesn't feel like it. Another person, again, made reference to divides. It makes it a poorer country than it need to be. And their sentiments that are expressed by people from a whole range of different cultures, not just Aboriginal people, but I think it really goes to that concept of, you know, why, why is reconciliation something that we need to look at? Now, the second quote, dangerously, is from uh, Corazon Aquino, who, of course, was in the Philippines and was president, um, as well as a member of parliament for a number of years. And she said, reconciliation should be accompanied by justice, otherwise it will not last. While we all hope for peace, it shouldn't be peace at any cost, but peace based on principle, on justice. And uh, Benson's also quoted Mick Gooder, who's our social justice commissioner, when he talked about the issue of at the declaration and linking that to what happens in Australia. And what he said is, a focus of mine will be resetting the relationship between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and wider Australia, government and finally amongst ourselves. The declaration can provide guidance in clarifying, establishing and strengthening these relationships. And for example, he quotes from the declaration, convinced that recognition of the rights of Indigenous people in this declaration will enhance the harmonious and cooperative relations between state and Indigenous people. So when we talk about reconciliation, we talk about it from an individual perspective, but it's not about making white people more comfortable with black people or vice versa. It is about restitution. It's about proactivity. And it's about recognising where the barriers are to realising equality. And I want to go back to some of the individual quotes that came to us about how does racism make you feel? Angry that people are judged by their physical appearance or accent, which they have no control over, instead of being judged by their actions. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Firstly, I thought Australia is a very kindly and friendly country, but racism will make me persuade all of my friends not to come to Australia for a study or for travelling. It divides people. It puts up barriers that prevent honest, open communication. We live in a society where we have to rely upon and look after one another, and we can't do that if we're selective on the basis of appearance. So reconciliation should make us think proactively about how we remove the barriers. I want to go next to good old Jimmy Carter, who you know has probably excelled more post being a US president than perhaps during his time as a president. And he said, one of the most basic principles for making and keeping peace with and between nations is that in political, military, moral and spiritual confrontations, there should be an honest attempt at the reconciliation of differences before resorting to combat. And reconciliation is important because combat comes in all shapes and sizes and it comes in quiet protests and noisy protests and it comes in alienations. And what we know is that racism if it isn't dealt with in some way, will create that isolation and resentment. So again, when people un answered our survey, they said, racism makes me feel like I'm a lesser human being and that I do not have the same rights and privileges of others. Racism makes me feel like I don't belong here and it doesn't matter how long I live here, I'll always be an inferior human being because I don't have white skin, blue eyes and blonde hair. 
Racism makes me feel tired. Tired that we're still having to battle stereotypes and discrimination based on our ethnicity. Racism makes me feel sad. Sad that I still have to battle racism in my workplace, my social networks and in the wider environment. Racism makes me feel like I'm a lower than anyone else, an intruder who's not part of this society. And these are individual people who've chosen to go online to talk about their particular experiences. So I think tonight is a night of talking to true believers, as uh, Jenny pointed out, but I think it's really important that we reinforce the resolve that we all have to do something to support reconciliation and something to address racism. And it's interesting that, um, um, you know, Malcolm Fraser, a past Prime Minister, has also stepped into this space in a very strong way to talk about issues to do with reconciliation and our First Nations people. And it's interesting for me because I'm old enough to have been out on the streets pelting tomatoes at him in 1975. And it's very disconcerting when, you know, years later you look up to them and say what a good job they're doing. Um, and reconciliation, he says, requires changes of heart and spirit as well as social and economic change. It requires symbolic as well as practical action. And I think that goes partly to the heart of what Benson talked about, certainly in relation to our First Nations people. I just want to finish with one final quote from one of the people who responded to our anti-racism survey and he said, uh, people should understand that we're all the same, just like one kind of object but painted in different colours, which I thought was a lovely kind of notion. So thanks very much for the opportunity to talk tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Helen. Uh, our final speaker tonight is Nazim Hussain. Nazim is half of the comedy duo Fear of a Brown Planet, which in 2008 took out the Best Newcomer Award at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. In 2007, Nazim entered Triple J's Raw Comedy Competition and beat hundreds of others to reach the Victorian State Final. Since then, he's performed sold-out shows around the country, including uh, performing as well at the Oxfam Comedy Gala, Gala and also appearing as a panellist on Q&A and the 7pm project as well. Nazim's performed at the Adelaide Fringe and Melbourne, Sydney and Comedy Festivals as well in 2011 as In Fear of a Brown Planet Attacks. Please welcome Nazim Hussain. Thank you. I would like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'm not racist, but... Um, I've heard that I'm not racist, but if I was in Saudi Arabia and I went to a mosque, I would have to speak their language and take off my shoes as well. I'm not racist, but uh, the locals in Malaysia are so much less annoying than the locals in Bali and Thailand. <laughs> Serious. I'm not racist, but Islam isn't even a race. So, <laughs> I'm not racist. I've, I've seriously heard them all. I've heard them all. And sadly, I continue to hear these things in, uh, in increasing regularity. And to talk about racism in Australia, it, it really does require more than the length of time that we have tonight. So, I'll, I'll do my best. We really do have a history that is very rich and arguably born out of racism, and we have a present that embodies that legacy. You don't need to look too far to understand the extent and prevalence of good old Aussie racism. Just turn on your TV. In fact, I've actually tried to actively stop watching Australian television, because for me, Australian TV is just so out of touch with Australian reality, right? Like, I think the last straw for me was when I happened to watch a rerun of the show All Saints the other day. You guys know that show? In the middle of watching, I started thinking to myself, I was like, hang on, this is a show entirely based around an Australian hospital. But what type of hospital has not one brown or Asian doctor? <laughs> Seriously, if you ever wake up in hospital and there is not one brown or Asian doctor <laughs> in that hospital, uh, you should get the hell out of there. <laughs> Because you're not actually in a hospital. Um, you're, you're just on the set of... 
a mediocre but well-loved Australian TV series. One of the most popular shows on Australian TV is Border Security, a series produced in very close cooperation with the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. 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 I have it. I have a citizenship. <laughs> but seriously, that show is it's seemingly designed to make ordinary people paranoid about foreigners, even for me, after watching. It's hard for me to not be suspicious of other brown people. It's that magical, the kind of show. It's like Obama when he speaks. It's true. I just get mesmerised. Oh, he's bombing. Oh, it's Obama. He's beautiful. Beautiful brown skin. But Australian television is also the... <laughs> Trying to move from funny to serious, but it's just not really working, is it? <laughs> but Australian TV um, is, is the contemporary home of blackface, in my opinion. We've seen a broad spectrum of blackface sketches spanning across all networks, from the ABC to commercial networks such as Channel 9 and Channel 10. And I don't know if you remember, but when the Hey Hey, hey, hey Saturday blackface sketch made news around the world, do you remember how we actually began a debate about blackface? We actually argued about an issue, about a genre, that the rest of the world determined was racist decades ago. Even Julia Gillard uh, defended the sketch. Probably no surprises there. But what was argued in the wake of that Hey Hey saga is true, that if Harry Connick Jr. hadn't objected to the sketch, no one probably would have blinked. In other words, it actually took a white man from America to start a conversation about racism right here in Australia. The point is, even though race does tend to make news in Australia with, with regularity, the reality is that the people who are in the public domain doing the talking are largely white people and large white people. <laughs> Not all my humour is highbrow. <laughs> but when, when the Hey Hey sketch made international news, the only people I remember seeing on TV, given the space and the platform in mainstream media, to discuss whether or not blackface was offensive were white people. How does that make any sense? That's as ridiculous as having only men speak about sexism and what is or isn't offensive to women. It makes absolutely no sense at all. But time and again, when it comes to race, white people tend to dominate the conversation. So it becomes very natural and reasonable for non-white Australia to perceive Australia and Australian culture to be normatively white. Non-white views concerning race or anything are rendered invalid automatically until and unless uh, these views are uh, validated by the dominant culture or community. Whereas white perspectives prevail unquestioned. For a society that sells itself as multicultural, only white culture remains unchallenged without ever having to constantly explain itself and justify its existence, let alone its peculiarities. And there are many. I've based a career on it. <laughs> but it's difficult to have conversations with everyone, as honestly as as we're having today about racism in Australia. It's particularly difficult for a brown person to talk directly to white people about racism. But it's, look, I, I do love white people. Uh, <laughs> I do love talking to white people, especially about racism in Australia, because no matter what, without fail, white people will always have the most hilarious responses to anything a non-white person says about race, right? Like, you could say something simple like, yeah, it's pretty racist nowadays. And sometimes a white person will correct you like you said something wrong or like you don't understand Australian history. A white person will always say, oh, Nazim, you see, you just don't understand Australian history. You just don't understand how things have always worked here. You see, everybody had it tough. Everybody had it tough when the Greeks and Italians came here. They had it tough. When the Asians, the Vietnamese came here, they had it tough. When the East Africans came here, they had it tough too, Nazim. So, you see, it's, um, it's, it's just your turn. It's just <laughs> your turn. Okay, so that's not a comforting story. Uh, that's more a story about a society that doesn't know how to stop being racist. <laughs> I've heard this question too many times. Is Australia a racist country? And to be honest, I actually don't even know what that question means because does racist country mean a country entirely made up of racists? Or is it a country with a majority racist population, or a country with racist elements. And in honesty, the question is pointless. What is undeniable is that Australia does have a problem with race and racism, and denying that reality and dodging it with these tricky questions serves no benefit. I, I get really annoyed when I hear, oh, well, yeah, okay, but 
in Saudi Arabia or Iran, there's so much more racism. You've got to agree with that, Nazim. Yeah. Well, so what? This is Australia. This is a society that boasts about being multicultural and democratic, progressive, liberal, tolerant. You know, how does it, how does it make... How, we, we boast about being a society that is not remotely anything like societies like Iran or Saudi Arabia. And being, hu and being more humane and, and, and better than these draconian authoritarian states like Iran or Saudi Arabia is nothing to be, prou it's nothing to be proud about. You, you're not going to put that up in a certificate on your wall and say, well, <laughs> better than Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Ridiculous. The reality is racism plays a part in the continuous inhumane treatment of asylum seekers. Racism plays a big part in the ongoing struggle for our indigenous people and the ongoing reality of life under, in under intervention. I mentioned earlier that Australia is a normatively white society and I'll finish on a bit of a, on, of a story that happened to me recently. Now sometimes comedians do make up stories to serve their performance. This is true, like, these things all happen to me. Um, I do have a, I have a suit job. I work in, um, in a corporate uh, office. And uh, the thing about Melbourne and people that work in offices in Melbourne is every like five to ten seconds, they want to go downstairs and get a, get a coffee and talk about coffee and mm, what kind of coffee are you having? Mm, yes, <laughs> my coffee is oh, large, oh, yes, mm, not as good as the other. Yeah. I don't even know. Actually, to be honest, if, I, if I'm not around my colleagues and I want to get something to drink from a cafe, if I, if I could, I'd order like a strawberry nest quick because it's, it's, it's pink and sugary. But you know, when I'm around my colleagues, I order like a mocha because it's got a bit of coffee. It's not, it's not as embarrassing as a hot chocolate. So this actually have The other day, I went, I, did, I went downstairs with them. They all ordered their coffees. And I went and, I said, and the lady behind the counter said to me, oh, what would you like? I said, I'll grab a mocha, thanks. She goes, all right, can I grab, can I grab a name for the order? And I said, yeah, my name's Nazim. And she goes, oh, do you have something easier to pronounce? Do you have something easier to pronounce? <laughs> My name's Nazim. <laughs> Nazim is easier to pronounce than both the words easier and pronounce. <laughs> Even mocha. Mocha has a silent ch in it. <laughs> I, have no, no idea. I have no idea how she gets through the rest of the menu. There are, there are some difficult words in there. Cappuccino. <laughs> macchiato. Berlusconi. <laughs> oh, that was so much funnier in my head. I was so upset. I thought I got, I got to freaking say something. I'm, I'm a freaking comedian. I got to think on my feet. I'm an edgy, political. So I was like, yeah, something, something easy to pronounce. Yeah, well, my name is Nazim. But you can call me Nathan, if that makes sense. <laughs> right. You can't fight the culture sometimes, so we need to do it together. That was basically my point. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for having me, and uh, enjoy that. Uh, thanks very much, Nazim. And before we move to our panel discussion and take your uh, questions via tweet, uh, we have a special performance by sisters Alicia and Emily Johnson. Together, they are Naracha and uh, they're 18 and 19 years of age and they're performing one of their original songs. Please welcome Naracha. Oh, uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Alicia and yeah, this is my sister Emily. Um, this song we wrote uh, was for our national um, NAIDOC week at our school and our music teacher actually said to us, you know, um, I was at the school captain at the time and they said, oh, you know, write a song that uh, you would uh, send a message to the, you know, the kids in the audience. So we decided to write this song and um, it's called Self-Determination, so we hope you like it. <laughs> Don't know where you fit into, into society Trust me, trust me I feel, I know your struggles When our ancestors weren't even given a chance 
It's up to us. We can make change, make change. They did for us. They did for us. They did for us. If you're sitting in that classroom, not paying attention. You should remember that our ancestors, they fought for you to be treated as unequal. It's up to us, we can make change, make change. 1967, we were counted as Australian. Even though, even though our ancestors were tied to this land. It's up to us. We can make change, make change. Thanks a lot, guys. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Alicia and Emily. <laughs> Thank you, Lockie. So we're now going to take some questions via Twitter. And uh, the first question is from Chris Pycroft, who asks, we're in an era of technological advancement for the greater good. How can we use this to contribute to eliminating racism? Who wants to pick that one up? It's ironic that that came through Twitter. <laughs> That's one way. Um, yeah. I, I, I think, um, well, one of my things that really annoys me about Australia, or just like in terms of what, what allows racism to, to exist, is uh, well, the prevalence of very uh, conservative media. Um, and so YouTube, um, blogging, it kind of allows you to create your own space to say some things that you want to say unhindered, to create your own platform, you know, um, and, 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 t and TV executives are finding that too, that young people are turning off from TV anyway and they're, they're getting onto YouTube and they're finding comedy and uh, entertainment um, from elsewhere. So I think that's a really effective and important medium to be able to say some things that you want to say. Uh, I feel that, um, that well, Twitter and social media is, a, is just a, it's a channel for communication, really. So it's um, a way just to, it's... It's a way to just communicate and uh, and get a message across. And it and they, there was a saying that you know, if you have a bad experience, you'll you'll tell ten people. If you have a good experience, you'll tell um, four or roundabouts. Um, these days, it's like two thousand people. It's four thousand people. It's six thousand people. And so, how do you share a good message and how do you make things viral? That's uh, that's what everyone wants to know. And it's uh, it's something that you you can't just you can't just develop and go. All right, we're going to make this video viral, but it is a way of just sharing great content and it's a way to, to start mass movements. And it's, uh, it's important. OK, I've got another question. Uh, we know it's important to teach children about tolerance, empathy and understanding early on. How do we teach their parents? <laughs> Anyone got any thoughts on that? Helen? Uh, well, I don't think I have a direct answer, but um, uh, I think one of, one of the things that's interesting at the moment is actually that we at a national level, we're talking about an anti-racism strategy. And the research that we've had done, uh, notwithstanding that it might, might not get through the Jenny test yet, um, is that uh, it really suggests that there's a, a very large group of people, many of whom are parents, who either have an unconscious kind of bias, so you know don't actually understand when they're being racist, 
um, or sort of need to be reminded about what the experience of racism is or, or are in that kind of, you know, I'm not a racist, but... Uh, and they're people, I think, who you can... I mean, kids can, can jog um, parents' uh, values um, and challenge those and, um, and that's one of the things I guess we're trying to look at is what the role of children are and how do we reach children as well as actually trying to reinforce um, a, a appropriate values as they're developing in young people. So one of the... Th one of the and Benson and I were part of a, a workshop in, in Melbourne um, where they talk about coffee all the time um, last Friday to actually talk about what are some of the participatory ways where we can reach young people and reach children uh, and uh, and one of the things that we're, we're actually thinking about doing is perhaps commissioning, having a story, children's story writing competition and that we might sort of frame that in a way which is about, you know, uh, what, what's the conversation you have with your parents about things like racism? I mean, there are all sorts of possibilities. So I don't think there's a straightforward answer. You've got to have multiple things you can do. OK. Anyone else want to hop in on that one? I think at a base level it's just about... Um, and this is childishly generalised, but it's just like saying, why do people have to be mean all the time? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, it's just... We're all just skin bags full of nerves and tears and bones and things like that. Right. So as a child, you kind of you kind of know that a little bit more maybe, you know, you scrape your knee it hurts. But as an adult, I think it's just it's just like just ask the question. Why why, you know, every day we go around and we experience things that are hurtful to us. We may intentionally or unintentionally, you know, bring hurt to other people. At the core, it's just saying just don't be an asshole. Just just don't. You know, it's very basic. If you wouldn't like that done to you, and I know I'm preaching to the converted here and I apologize for being you know, but it's to me, it's just so basic. It's just asking that question. You know, you wouldn't want... No one wants their child to be hurt, whether you're a parent in Sydney or Melbourne or Syria. You just wouldn't want that. So just don't in inflict it onto your children or onto the people. Case closed. All right. Um, a question uh, for Benson. You mentioned the, um, the Freedom Rides of 1965, which showed incredible leadership from a young group of people, university students, plus Charlie Perkins, people who, like Jim Spiegelman, who's about to take over as the head of the ABC, um, showed great physical and moral courage to tour country New South Wales to confront racism head on. They went to the Moree Pool and confronted the fact that um, Aboriginal children weren't allowed in the pool, uh, got run out of town, basically, by, by people there. What would you like to see young people in this generation do to confront racism? I actually, um, I grew up in Tamworth, um, about three, four hours away from Moree, and I've actually been to that pool a number of times and, and swam in that pool and didn't actually understand its significance until I was a, a bit older. It was never something that we learned about at school or anything like that. Um, I, um, for young people with, uh, I guess, social media, this is uh, like my belief that, um, so for Charlie Perkins and the other um, Sydney Uni students that, that did that road trip and went up through the Maurys and, and your Walgets and Walker. Uh, yeah, yeah, your Walgett. Um, for them, that was... They, they reached a national audience and, and that was uh, instrumental in the 1967 um, referendum. But for a generation with uh, social media, social media is our freedom rides these days. It's, it's a way that we can get those messages out. And, uh, and, uh, and there is a lot of great work that, that has happened and, and it's been building to that point and it's all focused on the um, recognition. So uh, recognising Indigenous Australians as the first Australians um, in the proposed referendum. I'm not sure if that's going to get up or when that's going to get up, um, but it has been um, kind of touted by um, Prime Minister um, Gillard that it's a once in 50 year opportunity. And so why, why should we miss out? Why can't we miss out? Why will we miss out on that? And, uh, and we shouldn't miss out on that. And, and how do we build the momentum? And, and we don't need those, the buses to physically get out and around because we have, those, uh, we have social media and other ways to connect with other people. One of the things about social media, though, is that you're not, you don't have to confront it in the face of people like Charlie Perkins and those guys did. How important is that is to, when you see racism to stand up and speak about it and to call it for what it is? Well, it's hard. Um, they showed a lot of resilience, a lot of strength, a lot of courage. Um, and, and like I said before, that when it hits you and it's so in your face and you're just not expecting it, it's, it's very hard to deal with it. Um, racism's 
in Australia it's changed a, a fair bit. So previous years it was very overt, whereas these days it's uh, subversive. Subversive racism, it's uh, institutionalised racism, and that's harder to call. And, uh, and it's, not, it's not a matter of uh, being courageous and facing it head on, it's a matter of uh, kind of being smart and, and actually weeding it out more than anything and, and actually being able to put a, um, put a name to it. Uh, which is, well, I, th I feel, is actually the hardest thing to do these days. Okay, no, another question via Twitter um, from Joy. What, what do you suggest the education part, department do to eradicate racism? Benson suggested that a change is needed in education. Does anyone want to pick up on that one? What education department could do? Helen? Well, I, I mean, I'm happy to have a go. Everyone talks about... Um, I think all of us look to schools as um, an opportunity to, um, you know, get a lot of these issues up so that we can produce kids who are not racist, who don't bully, who aren't sexist, who don't sexually harass and so on. And, uh, and I think, you know, it is important that they're really critical institutions. They're crowded places, so it's, it's actually hard to get... Um, uh, get some airplay there and in a way what you want is that there be a kind of, you know, what's the, the way that the schools deliver their, their education programs actually are built on a, a respectful, dignified culture which is kind of the basis for human rights rather than, you know, just focusing on one thing or another. Um, but, you know, you, you, what we've got to do is we've got to name racism. I think there are a lot of schools that, that do some really good work. Um, I went to a forum here at this university, I think, the other day with some boys from Ashfield Boys High School, I think it is, in Sydney, um, where they'd taken up a specific project around racism, a very multi-cultural uh, school. Even in that setting, the boys that actually spoke up were the white boys, uh, which was kind of interesting. Um, but uh, I think we have to name it and keep pushing it as something that has to be dealt with in education environments. I mean, it's, we're pushing to get it in the curriculum. We're pushing to get appropriate Indigenous history and recognition of human rights into the curriculum. And it has to be multifaceted. OK. Um, I've got a question for our comedians. Uh, humour can help... This is from Connie Yee. Humour can help break down boundaries, but what do you say about humour that reinforces negative stereotypes? Yeah, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I think for, for me, when I, um, Jennifer was talking about who you can really make fun of, for me, I think about comedy just like. Uh, so it's like a graph, right? On the say on the x-axis, such a nerd. You got. Like, <laughs> say the y-axis. Okay, well, x-axis. The further along you are, the more influence and power you have in society. The further along that 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 axis you are means you can only make. Basically, you can only make fun of people that are, are higher up in that chain than you. So white people, fair game for everybody, right? <laughs> Honestly. Uh, indigenous people, who, the, like, who am I to, to make a joke about Indigenous Australia? You know, th this is stolen land. This is, we're part of that, I'm part of that occupation. So for me, I can make fun of, I, I feel like I'm, I can make jokes about power and society. So what if I make a joke about white people that generalise and stereotype? Sometimes I, I get feedback when people go, oh, you know, it's just reverse racism. You make jokes about white people. It's the same if, if I made jokes about Muslims. It's not. You can walk out of the comedy show. You can walk out of a room right now and you're still going to see a million images of white people in various forms. If, if, you, if a comedian makes a joke about, about a Muslim person or about a, a Chinese person, you know, there are not as many images of Muslims in the media or Asians in, in, in pop culture, as there are white people. You're not going to walk out of a comedy show and go, oh, all white people can't dance because you've seen freaking video hits and some white people can. Like, it's, <laughs> it's not. So it's just that kind of, you know, who cares if someone who has, who has less influence than you in society makes fun of you? It doesn't change the power. It's about power. So if you understand that, you'll understand what you can, can and can't make fun of. That's my answer. Jennifer, you want to pick up on that one? Yeah, just quickly. I think um, I, I have had um, times before out of nervousness when I did my first hour-long show where I actually said white people when all I meant were people who probably, for the joke I was trying to tell, are not Chinese. 
I would <laughs> never have I would never say white people like that again. As a label, I don't like it. Um, my God, I sound like Pauline Hansen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is that, for example, I sat in a Fear of a Brown Planet show a few years ago in Melbourne and when you were talking about white people, I felt excluded, <laughs> right? You know, Pretty it, much, you're, you're classified when, as a brown. Because when you say... <laughs> that skin whitening cream's not doing its job. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Um, no, no, because I feel that if we divide it purely as, as brown and white... You know, which part of Australia am I belonging to, right? Yeah. Um, I, I don't think, I, you know, some of my best friends are white. <laughs> no, 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 but seriously, like, Steve, do you take offence when people say white people? Not, a, you not fit at all. into that. Not at all. I've, I come from an Anglo-Celtic background. Right. Um, I, yeah. So, I, yeah, I don't find that offensive at all. I... You know, like what Nazim was saying is that that's the kind of dominant culture, so, you know, it's okay to take the piss out of it. Yeah, them. but then there are white people who aren't in a position of power also. True, there are white class people, comes into it. Exactly, class, yeah. money, it's, it's, it's just... A, it's, I think at the end of the day it's about access. You know, it's about how many boundaries are there between you and your ability to access things that many people in this room may take for granted, like access to education and healthcare and, you know, a right to work in, a, in an environment where, you know you're not discriminated against and all that kind of thing. I, I don't find white... I, I forgot what the question was originally. But um, I don't find white people to be a helpful label. I, I really dislike it. And I felt terrible when I said that in my show when I just met everyone who wasn't Chinese because, you know, friends of mine that come to the show, they're white. You know, I have no business dumping stuff on them just because of their skin colour. I think any kind of label that makes it more broad as opposed to specific is actually damaging. Just as the way that you probably, when people say brown, it's like, well, what kind of brown? You know, okay, what kind okay, of brown are we talking okay, about? Okay, on the issue of humour, uh, um, Janine has tweeted, humour that reinforces negative stereotypes equals whatever Sasha Baron Cohen does. Is it okay to laugh at uh, Sasha oh, Baron look, Cohen? Interesting point. I mean, I don't like his movie The Dictator, right? Because could it work the other way around? He's a Jewish guy from a very privileged background reinforcing a, an already dominant, you know, perception of... Like, the perception of Muslims... Dirty, crazy terrorists who blow things up and don't speak good English, and you know, essentially, if you, the, the dictator, the jokes are made, the, the jokes are just Muslim jokes. It's not he's not taking the, the piss out of you know, out of a dictator and authority and blah blah blah. The jokes are just Muslim jokes. If it was the other way around, it wouldn't happen. You couldn't have, you know, or the, the the Hollywood, the movie industry wouldn't allow a an Arab guy to make fun of a Jewish dictator. You wouldn't be you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to have a Palestinian comedian to piss take like Ariel Sharon and have it have it given us the same sort of platform it's true it wouldn't happen it doesn't happen that way is that so for me it's like well it's just an, it's just you're you're shooting downwards what what holy cow are you you know what what system of power are you trying to deconstruct here you're not you know the world already understands that dictators are ridiculous um i don't i don't find that his movie is helpful at all Jennifer what your any thoughts on Sasha Baron Cohen I haven't seen the movie. Okay, but he's got other characters you probably would have seen. Borat, Ali G. Yeah. He uses stereotypes to, to, for, for humour. Well, sorry, just on one other point. I would say um, if, if you have the permission of, of the community that mm. you're making fun of, fine, go ahead with it. But if you saw Borat and if you, if you read into some of the articles that kind of came out after that movie came out, he went to a, a village in Romania and totally screwed that village. Like, there are people there, who, their families have been ripped apart because of, of his intrusion into that place. There was no money. They, felt they were paid two and a half pounds each. After you know, They were told that they were just kind of standing there and he's making a documentary about their village. Um, and then they find out later that one of them was a, was, was a prostitute, uh, the, the village prostitute. The other one, his mum was like... It's just, so there, is no, there was no love there. There was no kind of common understanding. That was just blatant abuse and, um, you know... That's, that's, that's not... Com comedy's supposed to be a vehicle to speak about a truth that you couldn't speak about in any other medium. For me, it's about speaking truth to power. And Sasha Baron Cohen does the opposite of that, so not helpful. OK. Um, religion of often represents power, be it the Catholic Church or Islam or, or whatever religion. Um, is it hands-off certain religions, could, depending so. on where you come from? No, well, look, I, I, would, I would say, hey, comedians go out and make fun of Muslims and Islam 
if it wasn't already a common understanding in Australia. In Australia, you think of Islam, it's not as if you need to make a joke about Islam being, you know, or Muslims treating women poorly, or that, you know, some of the practices are a little confusing to you. People, that's already the public conversation. That's already the dominant perspective in, in the public discourse. There's no need to, to go out and say, did you know that in Islam, the women have to cover their heads and the men don't? Because that's a little confusing for me. Like, it's ridiculous. These things are already understood. You've got to make points about things that you can't say because society, like, the, the you know, you're a minor. Comedy that's most important to me, and stand-up comedy actually started as an art of protest. Black comedians, black, black people in, in the, during the civil rights movement, that's when stand-up comedy really took off. When black people weren't given the space and the platform in society to say the things they wanted to say. So they created that space and stand-up was that vehicle for them. Jewish comedians did the same thing when they were treated poorly. Gay comedians, female comedians. This is a space for them to say some things that society wouldn't allow them to say. So comedy that does the, the opposite is just absurd. It just doesn't make any sense. It's like art that's, you know, that just bashes the... It's, I, just, I just don't get it. It just doesn't make sense to me. Okay, anyone else want to... Sorry for the rant. <laughs> that's all right. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, is calling Australia Day Invasion Day inflammatory at all? I find it is. It's perpetuating the same type of discourse. That's from Evil Pandas. <laughs> Benson, you want to take that one up? Calling Australia Day Invasion Day. Now, there's... <coughs> <laughs> is that a term you use, Benson? It isn't. It's not a term that I, I use. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, actually, no, I don't use that. I, um, for where I stand, I, I don't see that's um, progressive. I don't, I, I don't see it as constructive. Um, that's the way I kind of view um, my world is how we kind of, how we can move forward or how, not necessarily move forward in the sense of forgetting everything, but how can we kind of build on momentum or... And, uh, and when I think of Invasion Day, I just think of all the negative connotations that it has and I don't see it as being inclusive or inviting or, um, or, or friendly, really. And, uh, and yeah, it's actually, sorry, it's a, it's a really tough question to, <laughs> to answer. Um, but there is a lot of, um, and, and I understand why, um, there's a lot of um, people out there that, that do refer to it as Invasion Day. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a very powerful gesture to say, well, we were here, um, and you've come and invaded, but we're not. We won't celebrate a, a, a nation going forward. Um, and I, yeah, I don't. I don't necessarily share that view. Okay. Personally. Well, thanks for that, and thanks for all your questions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. But please uh, thank our panelists, Jennifer, Benson, Nazim, and Helen. Um, before you uh, leave this, at the Seymour Centre, please visit the exhibition after we finish. And also tomorrow night, there's a free Reconciliation Week party in the foyer upstairs from 7.30 with some live music. So thanks very much for coming along. <laughs>